Alright, please forgive me if there's a bunch of chicken noises in this video. I've been waiting for several hours and they have not shut up. Now, on to the actual video. So recently, the unknown was added to Dead by Daylight, and a lot of the community thinks that he's, well... Well, they're a bit torn on what they think about him, and a lot of people are saying that he's not very good. And I agree. If you lack the imagination or just pure stupidity to pull him off. Look, the unknown is a killer that works better the more you ask yourself, wouldn't it be funny if, and then immediately follow it up with something so dumb that it automatically fries the survivor's brain when it works? Wouldn't it be funny if I tried to ski ball the orb under a pallet? Wouldn't it be funny if I tried to cut them off by teleporting? Wouldn't it be funny if I tried hitting them through the wall? Wouldn't it be funny if I tried hitting them through the floor? Y you get the idea, right? The dumber you play with this guy, the better you're gonna become. But I'm going at this too fast. Let's rewind to the basics, okay? Starting off with the killer's name, which I'm going to level with you. Saying the unknown over and over again is going to get really annoying for all of us real fast, so let's just call him Jerry. Short for geriatric, that is. Despite what his name and appearance would lead you to believe, Jerry is your all-around average guy. Average height, average move speed, average terror radius, and all that happy jazz. However, what makes Jerry unique is a lot of semi-useful things that come together to create the beautiful mess that is on your screen now. Let's start with the teleport, as it's the least complicated part of his kit. While playing as Jerry, this yellow goop will slowly crawl up the edges of your screen. The more goop there is on the side of your screen, the sooner you're going to molt. The threshold of Finna Molt is equal to about halfway through the bottom of the survivor's portrait. At this point, the goop will rapidly begin to crawl up the sides of your screen until it fills the edges in about 2 or 3 seconds, after which Jerry will molt, leaving behind a husk that you can teleport to once it's active. If you wanted to delay your molting, you can spam tap your ability to set the goop back to the Finna Molt threshold while avoiding a large portion of the slowdown. A lot of people are saying that you can hold or spam your power while crossing the map to create teleport spots and cross the map, and while yes, this is possible, don't do that. Maybe if it's only a few seconds away, it's okay, but for the most part, it takes way too much time to set up teleports in this fashion, especially when survivors can just destroy the hallucinations in about 4 seconds. However, the ability to delay your molting is very useful in Chase. By tapping your power, you allow yourself an extra few seconds to get your shedling into position so you can use it better in mind games in a similar style to Dredge. You can also reset the goop a couple other ways, which you might find more useful if you're trying to set up a cross-map teleport. Walking through upright pallets, carrying a survivor, being within 16 meters of a hooked or already existing hallucination, walking directly under an empty hook, being in tight areas where there isn't enough room to spawn a hallucination, or performing any interaction like vaulting or kicking a generator, will delay and or reset your goo. The reason this is important to know is because there's a maximum amount of hallucinations on the map that you can have at any given time, and when you max them out, your oldest one will be destroyed when a new one is spawned yet another reason to not bother having it, setting up some crazy cross-map teleport web. However, if you do already have a good teleport that you plan to use in the near future, you can implement these tricks to try and delay your molting and getting rid of that good teleport, so you can potentially keep that teleport around for a couple more seconds. I'm not going to address too many specifics about his add-on since all of this info was from the PTB and when it comes out and when it comes to live, they might be completely different. But when it comes to teleporting, I will specifically mention the iridescent report and the blurry photo add-ons as they are way better than they sound. The iridescent report allows you to have two terror radii on the map at one time for a short while after teleporting. When you combine this with something like Unnerving Presence or Coltrophobia, it becomes a real chaotic match, especially on smaller maps like the game. As for Blurry Photo, it halves the slowdown after teleporting, which makes it incredibly good for mind gaming as, whether intentional or not, it seems most of the time you can't attack until the slowdown goes away, so in practice the real benefit of this add-on is being able to teleport and almost instantly attack someone, kinda like Hag does. This makes those moments where you teleport across the map only to interrupt a survivor who is trying to cleanse your shedling even more lethal for them, and with being able to get this hit immediately, you can very easily Follow it up with your power to down the survivor, since when a survivor gets disrupted while trying to cleanse your hallucination, they become weakened, leading to some potentially game-changing 10 second down, if you can hit your shots. You'll also find yourself in this situation more often than you'd originally believe, so that alone makes Blurry Photo a crazy add-on, making it yet another brown add-on that's somehow better than 95% of the killer's other add-ons. Just throw it on the pile. 
Alright, now with the teleporting crash course out of the way, we can get to where the real fun begins. Yeah, teleporting is a major part of Jerry's strengths, but let's face it, no amount of teleporting is ever going to be as flashy as getting a couple hits like these. If you want to start getting hits like these, the best thing you can do is to remember the phrase, if there's 90 degrees, it's a breeze. Also get used to hearing that because by the end of the video that's going to be drilled into your skull like a botched root canal. But once again, it seems I put the cart before the horse, so let's back it up one last time. Aside from teleporting, the other half of Jerry's kit is the UV Axe, an eldritch god that lives in his stomach. You'd best get used to having this guy around, as he's going to take you through pleasure and pain so immense, even Pinhead's trying to get in on it. And since you're going to have this guy around so much, let's give him a name, because unnamed Eldritch God is kind of cringe. How about Thomas? Long for Tom, that is. Now Thomas is a simple man. You hold M2 and he comes out, ready to fire. Ready to fire what? Well, we'll come back to that, because I do need to warn you. Although he'll never admit it, our friend Tom likes being the center of attention. So he'll take up a good part of your screen, slow your movement speed a fair bit, and as we covered earlier, prevent your molting while he's out to party. He's also a little noisy, so survivors might be able to hear whenever he makes an appearance if they're within close range. What makes Mr. Thomas so special is his little party trick of being able to shoot out these glowing purple projectiles that bounce once and then explode. Since we've already named the rest of Jerry's kit, we may as well name these projectiles too. How about... Um, orbs. We'll call them orbs. Short for object ready to bust, that is. Thomas shoots these orbs out at a very heavy-handed arc, and they can be a bit unwieldy at first, but let me tell you, once you get the hang of these orbs, they'll start lighting up your dopamine receptors like a 10-year-old in a Minecraft cave. Depending on how you hit the survivors, these orbs will either do one of two things. If you directly impact a survivor, they'll be heavily hindered for a brief few seconds and the projectile will pass right through them. However, once they explode, any and all survivors within its radius will be applied with the new weakened status effect. It is also important to note that this explosion lingers for about half a second and is very hard to see through. While weakened, survivors hit by any subsequent explosions will lose one health state. This does not count any direct impacts. Survivors can cleanse this weakened state by staring at you, because something something staring into the unknown. That means while you're playing as Jerry, if you want to do well as him, you'll either have to play peekaboo the entire game, or you'll have to abuse the fact that his explosions go through walls. And objects. And holes in walls you thought were purely cosmetic. And the stratosphere. Oh, and also floors. Especially floors. <laughs> Anytime you hit a survivor through a solid object is something I like to call a shatter shot. Shatter shots aren't just flashy trick shots, they're also the key to playing Jerry at his full potential. Anytime you can hit a survivor without them even seeing you gives you a massive advantage in several ways. Primarily, you get this massive advantage in terms of cooldown versus cleansing, because when the survivor can keep constant eyes on you, you can barely fire a follow-up shot with your power before they cleanse themselves of weakened. But with a solid barrier between you, it becomes infinitely harder for them to break out in time. Here, let me give you an example. In the brown house on Haddonfield, there's typically five spots where a survivor will be when it comes to the second floor. Repairing the generator, in the generator closet's doorway, in the doorway by the hole, by the pallet, or by the back window. It also just so happens that you can easily hit these spots very easily through the ground from the first floor. In most normal loops, it would be almost impossible to get three hits on a survivor without them breaking out of your power. However, in any place like the Brown House, for our dear friends Jerry and Thomas, the impossible becomes possible. Following this Brown House example, if the survivor wants to break out of the weakness, they'd have to get closer to you by returning to the first floor just to maybe get a line of sight on you. Meaning, once they get that close, you can just smack them normally. And before you try and claim this is a one-off area, it's not. The entirety of Badham is like this. 
Badham specifically is Jerry's playground because whether it be above or below, if you're not level to Jerry at any given time, you're half a second away from being history. Not to mention, you can easily bounce your projectile around the filler loops like it's a game of ping pong. And it's not just Badham. Lambkin Lane, Midwitch, the game, kinda, and the second floor of RPD are all places you are never truly safe from him, and those are just the maps I was able to test on the PTB before queues became 30 plus minute endeavors and my friends stopped being able to handle the heat that I was cooking with. If you want to take it a step further, most main buildings are two stories and you're just as vulnerable there too, as you are on the before mentioned map. And once again, this is just floors. If you shoot your orb slightly in front of where a wall meets the ground, you can have it detonate directly against the wall, meaning any sweaty comp survivor who's gracefully skimming the edges of the walls like a trained ballerina is going to be in for a very rude and very purple awakening. Naturally, as time goes on, survivors will adjust to getting hit through walls, so they're going to start running walls wide while you're not on cooldown. But even then, that's in your favor, because they're running inefficiently, so you're going to catch up very fast. Pair this with something like Bamboozle to block windows and suddenly you're breaking pallets faster than a couple of 12 year olds who just rolled up to the local Sephora. The ability to run away from walls is also why I'm putting such a heavy emphasis on hitting through floors. Because try as you might, you can't outshift W gravity. At least, until they add a jump button that is. Now I'm going to cut to a live commentary section where I explain how to hit through floors and ceilings consistently. So hitting through the floors is surprisingly easy. All you need to do is you need to remember the mantra, if there's 90 degrees, it's a brute. And what that means is anywhere where you see a 90 degree angle, like right here where this wall meets the ceiling, what you can do is you can aim directly at it and launch your projectile and it will immediately detonate. You don't have to be as close as I am, I'm just doing that for the sake of demonstration and because quite frankly it's easier the closer you are. The reason why this works, I don't know for sure, but I'm going to give a theory my working theory that this works purely because the orb detects both the hitbox of the wall and the ceiling at the same time. I keep trying to call it a floor, but it's a ceiling. I'm pretty sure it hits both hitboxes at the same time, counts that as the first and second bounce immediately, and detonates. And the nice thing about this is it doesn't even have to be a wall. It can be anything that forms a 90 degree angle. If you would please move to the, the doorway by the hole. So for this, to hit this doorway, you can either bounce it here, but you can also aim right here at this little, you can aim at these little debris parts that are hanging from the bottom of the roof, and if you hit it right, it'll detonate and hit the survivor, any survivor who's standing in this corner, which is a very common check spot where they were. I'm gonna let them break out, and I'll show you how to do it on the pallet, which involves a similar thing. With this pallet specifically, this little drop down right here is directly under the middle of the pallet. Meaning, if you aim at the right spot, you're able to hit through it. Why? Because the orb is hitting both first that little drop down of debris and the ceiling. You can do this pretty much anywhere where there's one of these little drop downs. These are very useful for hitting anyone who's camping this window, but at the same time, you can just do it normal. A good example of where this is might not be immediately obvious, but can be very helpful is on this wall here. We are directly underneath the god pallet on the first floor, and you can do it on the other one, but we've got this one here, so we'll demonstrate it. This one's also a little trickier to do. You can see the survivor right there, thanks to the object of obsession, and what we're going to do to hit them is we're going to aim at this corner here and immediately detonate. And just like that, you're able to hit the survivor through the floor, even if they're running through. You can hit them pretty much anywhere within the pallet range and a little outside of it. You can also launch you can also launch it and bounce it off this pipe. A little to the left of where this little connecting rod is. Right about here. And that'll hit the entire pallet area too. Really, it's up to you if you want to try and bounce it off the pallet. I just hit the corner twice there. You can pair this ability to hit through walls and floors with the orb's heavy art, allowing you to hit orbitals on survivors who, against literally any other killer, are in a completely safe location. To beat the dead Badem horse even further, take this example lineup on the generator in the basement of House of Pain. Because you can hit survivors through the floor, with a little bit of practice, you can hit them while you sound like you're still a far distance away. This means you can be out front lining up a three-pointer directly to their cranium, and they'd have no idea until the concussion sets in. If you want to try and get good at orbitals with either Jerry or Huntress, you should definitely consider binding your look up key to something more readily accessible than the, than the up arrow. The advantage of doing this is that once you get lined up horizontally, all you need to do is hold look up and you won't have to worry about barely missing your shot because you dragged up and to the right instead of just dragging straight up. 
Anyways, I'm not going to go into exact details like how far away you need to be to hit an orbital because this is still the PTB and I'd be very surprised if they don't increase his base projectile speed or range slightly as that seems to be a fairly common request when it comes to buffing him. That's also why I'm not covering exact numbers in any sense for similar reasons. I'm trying to make this guide as future proof as possible. So as long as they don't take Jerry down into the basement and do him like they did my boy Nimi, everything in this guide should remain relevant for years to come. And to any behavior employees who might be watching this, if the ability to instantly detonate orbs by hitting 90 degree corners isn't intentional, please, just don't touch it. Puff out your chest, straighten your chin, and be proud of yourselves, because you just made the most interesting killer in years. Just smile, wave, and accept the praise. Now I'd like to cover some niche strategies and or techs, as the DVD community loves to call them, that right now aren't very useful, but depending on what changes he gets between now and live servers, they might become a lot better. The first of these is smoke screening, where you take advantage of the explosion to hide your movements at, at a loop to let yourself get an easy M1. Right now, you're slowed so heavily during your attack cooldown that this isn't super useful, but there are some rare times on specific loops where it can work out pretty nicely against mid-level survivors. An easy way to make a smoke screen is to launch your orb directly into the geometry of loops that have uneven surfaces. Once again, remember, there's 90 degrees, it's a breeze, even things that may not immediately come to mind, like the hood of a car, the two rocks with a gap between them, a tree next to a rock, whatever it may be. The best part about smoke screening is when done right, you can obscure your movement while also weakening the survivor. This sets you up for some really nice combo hits when done right. The other use of the power is a lot more useful but a lot less flashy, and that's using your power as a dollar store clown model. The orb's explosion lingers for about half a second, so if you see a survivor get to, about to get to a strong area, you may be able to force them to either stop in their tracks for a moment, or in the best case scenario, encourage them to change their path entirely, potentially making them go to a weaker part of the map. Or they could be a dumbass and run into it anyways. Either way, really, it's a win for you. Oh, and you can also really easily punish survivors who try and farm in your face by launching your orb right as the unhooking survivor starts to lift the unhooked survivor off the hook. When done right, your orb will hit both survivors and weaken them or damage them if they're already weakened. Not that you, a good killer who always follows the survivor rulebook, would need to know that, right? Now I know earlier I said I wasn't going to discuss the add-ons in this, but I do want to mention a few standouts from the PTB, so if they remained unchanged, you have a good variety to start messing around with. The first is the currently green add-on named Vanishing Box. This add-on makes survivors who complete a generator weakened. While it won't injure already weakened survivors, this add-on basically does a third of your job for free. Another benefit of this add-on is whenever a survivor gets weakened as a gen pops, you know exactly who popped that gen and where they are. This is good for general macro game sense, however it can be useful in some more... devious situations. Overall, Vanishing Box definitely outperforms the average green add-on. And I'd go as far to say that Vanishing Box is better than the Iridescent Documentary add-on, which makes all survivors weakened at the start of the match, and I wouldn't be surprised if they swapped rarities with few or no changes to either. Another honorable mention goes to the yellow add-on that allows you to detonate your orbs on your shedlings, destroying them in the process in exchange for 75% of their respawn timer being filled. This allows you to have near-complete control over the details of your hallucination locations, along with allowing you to potentially use hallucinations as a makeshift backboard for some really cheeky hits. One final shout out goes to the add-on that gives you bonus yellow goop when you weaken a survivor, which is really good for a more aggressive playstyle when you're just trying to down survivors as fast as possible and not worrying too hard about map control, since it means you're almost always going to have a shedling in the wings whenever you need it. Since we're talking about add-ons, we may as well talk about perks. The obvious good perks are obviously good on Jerry. Things like Deadlock, Pain Res, Barbecue, Lethal, etc. are all good, but a perk that works especially well with Jerry's kit is Nowhere to Hide. With Nowhere to Hide, you can kick a generator, Quickly scan your surroundings, and if nobody is there, due to how crazy fast your teleport speed is, you can teleport and have just a few seconds of aura reading left, meaning you can also scan the new area you're in because unlike barbecue, Nowhere to Hide's aura range follows you around. Undetectable perks are really good when you want to do crazy lineups or floor hits because the survivors will have no idea that they're coming so they won't be in any weird places and they'll be very predictable in their locations. However, you can also use these to cosplay as your shedlings. But this is more of a meme than a real strat unless you run a whole build for it, and even then, your mileage may vary, because while you're standing there menacingly, if the survivors just don't bother to come back to whatever gen you're camping, you may as well be playing Basement Bubba at that point. Another good subsection of perks are the ones that require you to get a certain range away from a hooked survivor. Things like Devour Hope, Make Your Choice, Grim Embrace, and, you know, the usual suspects. They're all good because of your ability to immediately teleport away, and then teleport back just as fast, 
if you leave a Shedling within a close vicinity once the survivor gets unhooked. But by far the best perk you can run with Jerry is Dissolution. Dissolution allows you to confirm downs very quickly, as with your power, you can force survivors to vault pallets in weird ways and potentially hit them while they're vaulting, so you get a pallet break and a hit all at the same time. Survivors are also deathly afraid of your power, so sometimes they'll pre-vault a pallet, even if it's a really strong one, even if they're not in immediate danger, to try and get away from your power. Just make sure to do this in moderation, as relying on dissolution too heavily will come back to bite you. I played a lot of Jerry on the PTB. Once I tried dissolution on him, I had a real hard time taking it off, as it felt great to use, honestly. And finally, while learning Jerry, chase-based aura perks like Floods of Rage, I'm All Ears, and even Zanshin Tactics can all really help you with learning how to hit survivors through floors and walls. For the final chapter in this video, I'd like to briefly discuss how survivors will try to counter your power. While it's still too early for most survivors to know how to go against a strong Jerry, there are already some strats that have emerged. The first one is running loops slightly wider than normal. I touched on this earlier in the video, but as a momentary recap, even if survivors do run loops inefficiently to counter your power, it's a good thing because that means as long as you don't keep wasting your time by trying to get hits when they're clearly not close enough to the wall, you'll be able to clear pallets much faster than normal. Additionally, it's going to become very common for survivors to just leave the loop against you once they break line of sight. The best way to deal with this is before committing to any crazy hits, test out the survivor. Test the survivor a bit to see if they're the Shift W kind of gamer, and then play accordingly. And finally, some survivors will try to run towards you when you pull out your power to make it harder for you to hit them with the orb. And while this is effective at making you miss the orb if you're not expecting it, once you realize the survivor likes to do this, you can either bluff your power and immediately put it away and whack them normally when they run at you, or you can try and bounce it off of an object that's close to you, so that way it lands on where the survivor is and not where you think they're going. But overall, it's typically better to just whack them normally when they try and do this, because let's face it, you're not using that fire axe anywhere else. You may as well use it somewhere, right? I know this guide might be a little vague on certain subjects, but I wanted this guide to be as timeless as possible for Jerry as long as he doesn't get any major reworks. In the future, I may make more specific videos dedicated to one particular part of his power or how to play him on certain maps, and if I ever do, they'll be added to a playlist that's linked in the description. It'll probably be named something along the lines of How To Jerry, and if you're watching this video the day it comes out, the playlist will probably only have this video in it, but if you're watching a few months or even years in the future, hello there. And second off, consider checking it out for any more Jerry tips and tricks. Anyways, with all that said, happy hunting.